Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I have Alexis Laveille back, who is known as the No Bullshit Physio on Instagram. I had him on at the end of last year and it was very well received. Welcome back to Alexis. Hey, thanks for having me back. Pleasure. How's everything been? Uh, a bit hectic, like everything's broken like in terms of technology (laughs) i've like tried to do a podcast with my buddies and i had like four devices running just because my screen's broken so that's whatever that's why i was late to the podcast today and you've just otherwise good you've just launched some uh education series is that right yeah i mean it was launched before we're starting to be more active uh with the pragmatic rehab principal boys uh, like jacob deplar and elliot sarah um Yeah, we're still figuring out the context. I think we're just going to post slides and then save the videos for the courses. Yeah, and for the young physios and new grads and students out there, how do they get in touch with you in regards to that if they want to learn more? Uh, well, they have the page, like the Instagram page, probably the best place. And then yep. they can always reach me on my personal because I'm probably going to learn like a, sorry, launch a journal club on No Bullshit Physio. Yeah, I just figured everyone's been asking for it. So I'll probably just give it because I read articles anyways. It'd be nice to have someone to discuss it with. So a lot of people after the last episode I had you on for, they mentioned how amazing you were with recalling studies. And I've even said it to you via just text when we've been chatting that maybe research is a path you should go down because you're clearly passionate about it. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah something I'm looking into. Uh, i probably want to do it in Copenhagen because I like the things that they did for adductors, but I want to do basically the same thing for uh, low back pain, but I've been pestering the PhDs I know all around about like, what can I do? What can't I do? And what I really want is I might want to get an international supervisor that doesn't go to the, obviously to the university and just be in Europe. So my parents can see me more than like once every two years. Uh, And my friends, the same thing, because apparently if I go to Denmark, they're not I mean, I heard they're really cool, but apparently it's hard to make friends there if you don't speak the language. And I do want to learn it, but it's not going to happen in like a few months, you know? Yeah. Australia's on the cards as well, you said, maybe? Yeah, I mean, it's 50-50. It's just, it's far. That's literally the only problem. Yeah. And also I'm afraid of like everything wants to kill you there. <laughs> you even have like a tree. What's the tree called? The tree that like, if you get, like if you get sting, stung by it, it's like fiberglass basically. And it hurts you for 20 years. Have you heard I, of that tree? No. Yeah, it's just basically little pins if you run into it and you have like chronic pain that's excruciating for it that lasts about 20 years. No, I'd love to know more I've about this though. Look it up. It's, it. yeah, I think it's it, called like literally the pain tree or something. It, it, it's pretty funny that you mentioned it because literally as I was sitting down getting everything <laughs> sorted for the podcast, to my yeah. left, I saw this thing ro- running along the ground and it was a little spider. And when I say little, it was probably about that big. It was a big huntsman. So I like Jesus. put a put a Tupperware container over it and slid something underneath it and let it outside. Anyway, save it for dinner. Yeah, exactly. Good protein levels. Yeah. Well, today we wanted to discuss some of the controversial things going on online at the moment with this orthopedic cost dribble that we've both chatted about (laughs) um, via Instagram threads, et cetera. Um, Can you just break some of the, I suppose, the posts down for the listeners? What happened? And also your take on this orthopedic cost rationale. So I think Mark Boyle went on Twitter and he started saying that, you know, some exercises were good and some were bad, which, okay. Um, And he said, he boiled it down to what he coined as orthopedic cost. He said like, it's basically some exercises give you more mileage on the car and you can't uh, bring the dial back or whatever. So it's the old classic, like humans are cars, so we should treat them like cars. Uh, like famously, Stuart McGill is known as the back mechanic. So I don't know what like these nocebo guys have about cars. <laughs> I think they just really like old cars, you know, white men like old cars. So yeah, just, yeah, humans are machines. So let's just treat them like this. And I don't know, it just, it's like a spit in the face of everything we've learned in the last years about how resilient the body is and adaptable it is. And also that, I mean, there's a strong case to be made. I was having a discussion with uh, Jacob Teplar recently and to say that people don't get, you know, they don't get joint damage. Sorry, my cat's kind of messing around. We don't get joint damage for doing too much, except in extreme cases, we get them from, you know, doing too little most of the time. 
that's yeah. why like in my opinion it's probably why why the joint replacements are getting more prominent also because it's easier to do now that we have the technique down but it's like if you look it's in the usa right where everyone's like well, a lot of people are obese i think the obesity rate is like at 45 percent since covid hit so i went up like eight points um it's not except in elite athletes the data like there's a study by the costa in 2019 and it it kind of fits with the whole trend the the costa study was on crossfit uh, people and you know up to beginners and moderate level it was fine it was actually like very low in terms of injuries except if you get to the pro crossfit level where the rates of injury spike and my my take on it and you see the same for soccer as well i think it's like very high for soccer players at the elite level, but kind of low at the amateur level. And the reason is probably because when you get to a pro level, and when I mean pro, I mean like pro, like nationally ranked, not like NCA level where, where the injury rates remain kind of low, uh, where you're just pushing the envelope with like human capabilities. So you got a lot of like um, injury prevention mechanisms that like inhibition that we are turned on at most times to protect the body so we don't uh, exert ourselves too much and we can recuperate. But like the classic example I, I, I use to explain it to patient is like, you know, if, uh, you know, the baby stuck under the car, the mother lifts the car, you know, there's a rush of adrenaline. I don't know if it's the adrenaline, but basically you can be much stronger because those inhibitions go away because there's something way more important for your survival or at least the survival of your, your, your DNA. So athletes are able to tap into that strength easier so it's good. They're more, they have more performance, but the, the, you know, the counterbalance to that is that they get injured easier. Again, I'm kind of like doing a whole thing. I don't have like a specific study on this. It's just my evaluation. It just makes sense. Um, yeah. But this is based on obviously the science that you've read and you know, and yeah. also your opinion based on that science. So opinion, yeah. you, everyone's allowed to have an opinion. But at the same time, <laughs> but at the same time, it should be an opinion validated by the science if we're working in the in the world we do. Yeah, exactly. But one thing I could say for Boyle is I think maybe he's used to working with high level athletes because of his reputation, and he it might be that in his world, bio biomechanics matter more. I don't think his opinion is valid anyways, because what he said is like some exercises are bad, some exercises are good. But what we see is that usually the more stressful the exercise, the more we get out of it in terms of like hypertrophy, uh, like what do you call it? Like adaptation, like the Franco study in 2021, like elite, elite rowers, their discs thicken to meet the demands of repeated flexion. Yeah. And that's proportional to the level that they're doing like rowing the more they row the thicker their discs are and we see the same thing in weightlifters yeah and a lot of what Boyle's saying is he prefers unilateral movements to bilateral so going with say a split squat or a bulgarian split squat versus yeah. a squat but he's saying that if you go with a squat or a deadlift which is bilateral there is more wear and tear and i'm doing that in inverted commas because you know yeah. even greg lehman he discusses this and says it's wear and repair not wear and tear yeah. You know, that's a good way to think about it. You know, exercise is stimulative for the articular cartilage um, yeah. and sitting on your ass the rest of your life, things aren't going to work out pretty well for your joints if you literally do nothing and you end up really overweight or obese, potentially. Exactly. So uh, I think the other thing that he's mentioning is dumbbells are a better option than barbells <laughs> for a lot of upper body stuff like bench pressing. And I'm just sitting there tearing my hair out like, why he's just creating more barriers to exercise than we already have and before yep. the podcast that we came on today i had a look at the australian australian stats because a lot of people overseas think that australians are really fit and active but yep. according to the research on the australian government website 55 percent of adults in australia do not reach the adequate amount of exercise per week and this was the most damning stat 70% of two to 17 year olds don't hit enough exercise or do enough exercise per week, 70% of kids. Jesus. And that, and that just makes me sad. Like I'm, it's kind of devastating considering, especially for me, you know, growing up, I was the most active kid ever. And I feel like all of my friends where I grew up in Wagga was super active, but now it's 70% of kids are not active enough. It's crazy. Yeah, and then you, Michael and then you, probably thinks it's because of his TikTok. 
Well, that that is one of the things that's actually mentioned in that Australian government website. And they mentioned that social media is a massive, um, massive factor, screen time, movies, people being sedentary, all the, and life's just too easy. And also the other thing is people are doing a lot of work from home and even kids in the last two years being at home, getting homeschooled because of COVID. So it's frustrating when you're seeing a supposed expert creating more barriers to exercise when people aren't exercising enough in the first place. Mike uh, cut off. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you, but it's kind of like blurry. Okay. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's kind of muffled. All right, let's stop that. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's... Now? Okay. Yeah, I got you now. Yeah, I got you now. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Let's okay. just cut, cut that part. What were you saying? Sorry. So I was just saying that it's just depressing the fact that, you know, 55% of adults in Australia, yeah. which is often a country that, you know, people think we're all really active and 70% of kids from seven, from two to 17 years old aren't reaching 70%. I just, it shocked me. Yeah. Aren't reaching the physical activity guidelines. And then you've got a guy that's a supposed expert saying, you know, creating more barriers to exercise that are just making things more difficult when at the end of the day, we just need to get people moving a little bit more. <laughs> and yeah, the, yeah, the guidelines by the World Health Organization, they're not crazy either. Like it's 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise per week combined with two strengthening sessions. And I've done a post on this before on my Instagram for you to be termed moderate intensity exercise, you can walk at five kilometers an hour for it to be termed moderate intensity, which is effectively just walking a little bit faster than you would normally walk. So um, yeah. a bit more of a power walk and you can easily get that done per week and two strength sessions per week of 30 minutes. You know, everyone can fit that in. It doesn't matter how busy you are. Um, so I, I think that was the most frustrating thing for me was you know, creating barriers that just no don't need to be there. Yeah. It's like they're using microscopic reasons to prevent macroscopic solutions. It's like, you know, in water, there's traces of arsenic. It's like saying, hey, there's like 0.1 millionth of a millionth of a gram in water. So don't drink water. And the people there are just dying of thirst. It's like, come on, man, just see the big picture for a little bit. Yeah, and I'm all for, I'm all for using unilateral work rather than using bilateral work, but I, I don't use it for the reasons of this orthopedic cost bullshit. You know, I'm, I'm using yeah. it for the reasons often with an athlete that most of the time they're spending on one leg when they're playing their sport, when they're running and sprinting and that sort of thing. So it makes sense to strengthen them on one leg a little bit. And also, especially unilateral stuff, for say, for instance, an ACL or something like that makes sense when you're going to have deficiencies side to side so to even things up it makes complete sense to go with the unilateral stuff but in regards to the orthopedic cost thing it really is just ridiculous um and as you said before like human beings are not a car we don't have an engine and we can't like using that analogy <laughs> using that sucks. analogy is just so stupid yeah if, if in case people were worried, I actually made a list of like all this. Well, I mean, it's not exhaustive because there's so many, but the, like a quick list of like studies showing the body adapts. So like if you look at Horga and all in 2019, she showed that uh, running, they, they took like people before and after a marathon for training for six months. And I think it was women with mild OA. So, you know, car cartilage damage and it got better. So they got better radiographic scores after the marathon. And that was preserved after six months, I think. So when the follow-up study, uh, then weightlifters, they don't have thinner discs. So gents did a study in 2020, they don't have thinner or like weaker discs than the average. Actually, Grieslag did a study in 2014 and they showed that they had thicker discs. So basically the discs adapt to meet the demand. Uh, there is like a decrease. So basically discs become thinner, but that's only, it's the same as in people who don't lift. So it doesn't make a dent at all, all right? When you get up, basically your disc gets thinner. It's a normal reaction from gravity and just moving around. Uh, and then uh, Vidal and all showed that weightlifters, oh no, sorry, uh, was it weightlifters? 
well, whatever. There's low compared to sedentary people. There's less disc damage. So uh, I hate the term disc degeneration, but basically disc thinning uh, is not more prevalent in people that are more active. Uh, same thing, low and low and all in 2019. Uh, yeah, people who exercise have like better knee <laughs> OA scores. So it's basically like. I don't know. Like, it's not like he went a little bit against the scientific consensus. He just shit all, all over it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. And I don't know. His excuse was basically I have more experience and I'm older, but there's older people who lift more than them uh, and like know better. It's, I don't know. Yeah. I, and the, the running, running is a, a really big topic when it comes to people coming in as clients and they say, oh, running's bad for my knees. But, you know, yeah. that's been debunked multiple times via multiple studies saying that typically people that run will actually have better outcomes in terms of not having issues with their knee long-term with osteoarthritic change, that sort of thing. It's stimulative for articular cartilage. Um, the other thing is people that run regularly often have, or most of the time will have a lower BMI, which will then deload the joint. Then people aren't going to be overweight or obese potentially as they age. So, running is great and it's great for your yeah. knees. And I remember Tiger Woods came out a couple of years ago and said, oh, all the running that I did when I was younger, early in my career wore out my knees. And like, I love Tiger Woods, like I'm a golfer, but at the same time, some of the things that he said over the years about his back, but also his knee is just fraught with pseudoscience. And the amount of people that came in after that that were either yeah. golfers or just lay people and they they heard that he'd said that you know i'm just consistently debunking these bullshit myths that we shouldn't have to debunk because people yeah. get airtime that don't deserve airtime 100 percent, yeah um about the bmi thing uh i i'm pretty sure it's my bias too that like weight loss uh will deload the knee if it's very severe but the study you know that that quote like um what was it 10 a 10 percent body weight loss um, will increase, reduce OA pain by 50%. If you look at the results of the study, it's pretty weird because they concluded, and that's Greg Lehman who noticed this, but like it, the they said that it was because of the decreased load on the knees. But if you look at the data, they didn't it didn't decrease. So it was different from the group. Basically, the groups were like a tiny bit different at the start, and then the they were a tiny bit different at the end. So there was like a between group difference, but the groups that got better from the weight loss. If you compare them to them in the past and then them after they, they've lost weight, there's no change in the loads on, on, the, on the knee. Yep. So basically, it's probably not because the, the knees are loaded differently. And that's you can see that from exercise too. We don't change the loads on the knee. It's probably more just that uh, it has an effect on like uh, low-grade inflammation and yeah, possibly and just like a bit of placebo, honestly. Yeah, lo losing the weight will obviously change the, the infl inflammation for sure. Like if, yeah. they have, if they are overweight or obese, but... It I suppose in terms of the loading on the joint, I, I think loading of muscle tissue is a big one. The loading of muscle yeah. tissue definitely changes in terms of the percentage. Like if you think about, you know, the amount, if you're 110 kilos, if you look yeah. at some of the research loading on, if you're running, if you're loading the calf, say for instance, the soleus takes up to six times, six to eight times body weight. But if you lost yeah. 15 kilos, then obviously it's going to be a little bit easier for that soleus to cope with longer distance running. Yeah, functionally, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I agree with you that, yes, it's not just the loading that changes um, based on the weight loss. It's the inflammation that's changing things too. Um, and one reason I find that useful is because when I tell it to patients, if patients have been obese for a while, it's really hard for you to link the pain with the weight loss. Mm. If you just go like it's the lifestyle, which is kind of true, uh, it's going to be easier for them to engage with exercise. Because it's not this lofty goal of losing like 10% of their body weight. It's more like, hey, I need to be more active. Mm. Uh, I need to, I want to play with my kid or whatever. And then eventually maybe they lose weight because of this, you know, yeah. but you get, them, you, get, you get them started. So basically you remove that barrier to exercise where it's like, hey, maybe I can't do this because they can't pick up a dumbbell, but maybe they can't. They've been trying to lose weight their whole life, you know? Yeah. And, and I think another thing is people underestimate the value of simple things like walking, you know, like they see these... Yep ridiculous claims online and then there's barriers created but then they don't think that walking is good enough but as i was saying before if you walk fast enough it's termed as moderate intensity and you know a couple of strength sessions at home per week or in the gym and happy days you're being pretty healthy from an exercise standpoint 
Um, yeah. And considering the the stats are pretty horrendous, well, you're doing better than most. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you wanted to talk about uh, overcomplicated exercises. Yeah, I I really did because I feel like everyone online is just trying to one up each other. You know, like I, I saw this post the other day of on fuck it, I'll just name the name N one education at Coach Kasim. He was um, mentioning that he calls it the CAS bridge versus a hip thrust, and the CAS bridge is effectively just the um, the top of range of a hip thrust, and he's calling it a CAS bridge. And Isn't that Contreras that we invented that? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And this guy's calling it a CAS bridge because the top of the range he's claiming is more bridgy and it's isolating the glutes more because it's just effectively doing a pulse at the top. Yeah. And I'm just like, you literally just... I was pulling my hair out because it, it's semantics. Like, who really cares? Like, do a hip thrust. It's called a hip thrust. It's always been called a hip thrust. And now you're just trying to say that this is better than an original hip thrust when it's just not necessarily the case. He's literally nearly doing an isometric with a pulse at the top. And it's, it might be an effective strategy for some people, but what's wrong with people doing a normal hip thrust? I just feel like yeah. people are just overcomplicating things and coaches get to the point and athletenx.com is a good example of this people i feel like strength coaches and like pts and stuff they run out of content and they just make some shit up don't you think yeah 100 percent. yeah well yeah i mean i think i mentioned i don't know if i talked about this but the um, the studies on like uh, disinformation um or misinformation what we see is that what drives the algorithm is not that the information is false it's that it's novel um, and also like we know from studies on traditional news that, uh, negative info, like news that like, Oh, this could hurt me, uh, is going to get more traction it's just because that's human nature, right? We need it for survival. Like you can, you can forego the apple, but if you drink the poison, it's going to hurt you. You know what I mean? So that's how the brain works. So a lot of like the, don't do this, or this is bad. This is good. It just plays on that i think and that's one of the reasons why it's probably really popular on instagram and like other social media and even on in traditional media but that aspect that you mentioned like the cas thing yeah it's like a micro detail and honestly my reaction is just who gives a shit um, yeah exactly it's just like <laughs> if you want to do hip thrust do hip thrust if you want to call them hip thrust call them hip thrust if you want to call it a glute bridge call it glute bridge but at the same time like you know calling this a cas glute bridge because you're just doing a pulse at the top i'm just like who cares it's just ridiculous yeah. it's just again it's just people you know coaches trying to create i think they want to feel smarter than they really are they're trying to create this aura around themselves to think that they're an expert in their field you know yeah i think i'm just gonna you know there's like different razors like there's our Olcom's razor and then there's a hitchens razor i think i'm just gonna invent the alexi's razor who's like who gives a fuck who gives a fuck literally that's the razor do you give a fuck no okay next like I don't <laughs> yeah uh, in terms yeah, of the, i mean in terms of the research obviously we've discussed this before um via instagram when we're just chatting online and you know there's multiple and there's a heap of studies out there including the little world studies that you've mentioned before that um effectively just tell us that you don't need to do complicated exercises to achieve a result do you want to just go through yeah. a couple of those uh yeah i mean uh do you want to talk about pain or performance let's start with pain uh well if you look at pain the most glaring one and the one that hurts the most as a physio is the ganders ganditian study in 2017 have you heard of those the placebo studies yeah so it's one of the first that yeah they, they use like placebo exercise so they did a study for glute med tendinopathy and they loaded outside so basically muscles that they did exercise that wouldn't really recruit that and then they compared it to very, very targeted, heavy uh, glute med exercises, and they didn't really find a difference. There was a small difference, but it was in a subgroup that responded really well to heavy loading only. But overall, in the general population, it didn't matter. So maybe at a microscopic level, it does. My bias is probably like elite athletes uh, in particular, or people with like more severe cases. I don't know. We needed more. We need more study on this. But basically, you can do just general exercise, and it's probably going to help for a host of reasons. Uh, possibly patients feeling safer, uh, reduction of like local low inflammatory, um, 
levels and just like exercise as a general analgesic effect, right? At least have like lower pain thresholds, uh, higher pain thresholds than the general population. So whatever, they're just less sensitive. So you make people less sensitive. Um, the Little World studies, they compare like supervised progressive uh, strengthening exercise uh, with a physio to just doing like one exercise. Uh, they were like, what's your most painful movement? And I actually used this with my, a buddy of mine. He was a, he's a doctor. So he was really busy. He could only see me once. I was like, you know what? You like to read research. I'll let you read the article. Uh, here's the full, full article. And then you, we're just going to do this. I was like, what's the most painful thing? Like, where are you consulting me? And he's like, well, it hurts when I serve, like where I serve, uh, when I play tennis. So I was like, let's just find a, a version of the serve that you can, you can tolerate. And you're just going to do this a bunch of so like three sets of 10 a day. <laughs> he just did that and didn't, didn't need to see me again. I mean, pretty simple. Uh, there is like a qual study that Littlewood did in terms of follow-up that showed that like having being there for um, like kind of like booster sessions. So basically addressing the people who are not going to respond to this is really important. So that's usually what I do. Like I, you know, I pick a movement, but I don't see my patients just once, uh, except if like that's what the patient wants. Uh, but yeah, basically you can go really simple. So I'm not saying you need to see your patient just once. That's be oversimplifying it, but you definitely don't need to see the patient 17 times to cue the obsturator internus of the <laughs> lateral anus. Like who gives a shit again? Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, backed up by a lot of the research with uh, with the back pain stuff. So yeah, you know, in terms of in terms of exercise, it doesn't really matter what type of exercise you do for back pain. It doesn't need to be very specific. You can choose stuff that you're keen to do. You're going to continue to do. Um, it doesn't need to be something specific. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a recurring thing is like, we just need to get people moving. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I'm going to say, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you look at the Jill Hayden papers, the one that said the systematic review in 2021, I don't know if it was the umbrella review or the systematic review she did. She, she did too. Um, the conclusion was like that Pilates and McKenzie were a bit more effective, but that kind of, that difference was like, kind of disappeared if you look only uh if you normalize for dosage so basically the amount of loading if you like let's say someone did 100 reps because with mckenzie that's what you do usually you do like every two hours you do 10 reps if you uh take away that and you, you adjust for that the mckenzie wasn't superior so basically my bias is it's just that mckenzie's a low low load way that feels safe and confident you give them a good narrative so that's like hey this is going to make your pain better and you can do that a bunch. So you get people moving in a tolerable fashion and it helps to low back pain. So basically, and again, it kind of, it's like even we're going even further. It's not that we need to get people moving is we need to get them moving as much as possible in a tolerable and safe way. And yeah, the people and were looking at these little things. They're not only making people feel, uh, move less, they're going to be, they're making them feel less safe. So it's kind of like counterproductive as fuck. Yeah, completely agree. And I think the big thing here is finding something that is sustainable for the person as well, that they're going to continue to do. You know, if, if they've never I don't know, done Pilates before and you have a bias towards Pilates and you push them into Pilates, the chances of them staying and continuing on with Pilates may be quite low, but if yep. they've always been um, someone that really likes walking or hiking or something like that, would you be better off to go down that route? Probably because they're going to stick to it. Yeah. hundred percent. So, yeah, no, I agree. And the other thing that I've seen online that kind of annoys me is when these strength coaches and PTs out there look at the anatomy of the muscle tissue and look at the specific joint angles that they need to make sure that they're switching on certain muscles when they're doing, say, a lateral raise or a face pull or something like that. And again, I just don't think the general public really need to know that much, you know, like I feel yeah. like they're just, again, overcomplicating things and making themselves feel smarter than they really are. When does it really matter if the lateral raise is directly to the side or slightly to the front or more in scaption? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just feel like it, it's the, the fitness industry is a bit of a laughing stock, I think, online often. You know, the, the amount of free information that people have can get online, but there's, yeah. a, you know, at what percentage of good information, what percentage of the fitness information is actually good? I would say pretty low compared to a lot of other industries. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, I wouldn't say it's the laughing stock. I think it should be though. <laughs> <'Cause> people <laughs> give it way too much credence. Um, 
It's funny that you're mentioning this. The, the, the one study on the like top 10 videos for low back pain online. And they compared to the best practice guidelines. And it was like 90% of the information there wasn't in line with it. Is this on it's basically like yeah. where were these videos? On YouTube. They just look at the top 10 videos for low back pain. <laughs> we're like, yeah, there are 90% of it is not in line with the best evidence. <laughs> it's pretty fun. And obviously, I'm pretty sure like Bob and Brad have one there. They're super up to date, obviously. <laughs> Bob and Brad, the in my opinion, guys. Another good example of the, the whole overcomplication of exercises is your mate, functional patterns. Oh, just doing, doing like the whole sling um, fascial stuff really annoys me. You know, I remember yep. I have, um, I just somehow acquired the uh, Anatomy Trains book over the years and uh, I've had a bit of a peruse of it. But when, when people were mentioning the, the fascial slings and how they're integrated and all this sort of stuff and you should use them to create training programs and, you know, people have shoulder pain because their foot is too tight and shit like that. <laughs> You know, I, I immediately just call bullshit. Yeah. But there's, there's people out there using this model though. Yeah. And it's insane. Cause like the, that, that is, I don't remember, but like the, I think that's from regional inter, interdependence. I don't remember who did the original paper on this, but it, I read that paper. I had to read it for a program and it was, it's based on like no science. It's basically just an idea. And then just people ran with it that like, Oh, if the traditional, like, evidence-based ways that uh, a joint can affect you like the one above and the one below have an effect there is some truth to it but like the fascial thing like the, the your big toe can affect you like listen <laughs> scapular dyskinesia like literally the shoulder joint how it moves doesn't affect pain why would the big toe affect the shoulder it makes no sense <laughs> it's just uh in law we call this like an uh, a fortiori argument it's like if you're not afraid of a of a dragon you're not going to be afraid of a dog well you know if your if your shoulder mechanics don't affect your shoulder pain i don't think your big toe mechanics are going to affect your shoulder and i think we can say that about pretty much everything uh, every people treat specifically the fascia because it's every like it's always everywhere they're like oh fascia the fascia connects everything fascia is everywhere but then they target it it's like well you're doing everything at the same time like that doesn't make sense it's only everywhere when it's convenient, but otherwise it's very specific. You need to train this very specific way for this thing that's everywhere. It makes no sense. Yeah. It drives I, me nuts. I was, I was working at a clinic years ago and I had a little bit of like mid back pain from playing heaps of golf. And I ended up seeing one of the clinicians there who was the, one of the, I suppose, directors of the clinic. And I remember, hopefully he's listening to this. Um, I remember... <laughs> seeing him for it and he said that i needed to work on my foot strength and on my left foot because that my left foot at the end of my golf swing was too weak to control the end of my golf swing so then my thoracic area was getting overworked because i couldn't control the 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 last bit of my golf swing and like i just went with it because it was obviously one of the directors but at the same time like where in your logical mind how do you think that that is going to affect the thoracic spine it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever so yeah. yeah i agree um now let's jump into the bad science stuff this is your realm mate so bad science what does it look like and what can we do yeah, to make I think I just wanted to go on a rant. Yeah, mate, go for it. This is the, yeah. the floor is yours. Go on a rant. Let's do it. Bad science. What do you want to happen going forward in terms of science? And what does bad yeah. science look like? Um, the reason I wanted to go on a rant is I've been debunking a lot of people, and it's really annoying that I have to go into the weeds and look at this study and be like, yeah, this study's like dog shit. Cause like it should be the role of the PhD that's doing it, the, the master students who's doing it. Cause like, I mean, it's kind of easy to do. Like I'm thinking of doing my PhD and I have the, the protocol in my head. I know it's really hard to do research, to produce research, all the weeds, but to do the protocol, to do it in a way that makes sense, like prima facie is kind of, it's simple, right? If you do a study that can't prove what you're 
like what you're proving it's a bad study and it shouldn't go past ethics so like our best example is the a plus b study versus a study so like uh there was one on the schrott method where they're like hey we did usual care and then we added scrooge method and then compared to just uh usual care and then we're like scrooge method works it's like you compared it to nothing <laughs> Like, I hate that kind of study because it's it's biased to make something work. The only time it's useful is to show that something conclusively doesn't work. Like if it's not better than anything, that than nothing, then that it doesn't work. But usually people use it to justify that something works. So they, and that's really problematic because we see from stuff like, I mean, for Neoa, the twenty was it twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two? The I think it was twenty yeah twenty twenty one. The Bandax study on knee injections uh compared to like exercise for neo they didn't find a big difference and the reason is because they they uh what do you call it they uh time match the patients so basically we call that like an attention control they gave it an injection but instead of just giving the injection and being like hey bye they the physician was there to attend to their needs and talk to them and then the other group it was just exercise and the physio was there at the same amount of time they did that with a star trial as well, like a couple of years earlier, and they found the same results. So I think it was like basically socializing older people and comparing that to exercise. And they found that the majority of the, the effect was probably from the fact that because they didn't find any difference between the two groups that, you know, people feel cared for and they have like positive expectations. And you see, that's a time match. But then they, there's these studies, who don't even, they, they don't even time match and they just use the, the design to justify stupid interventions. And I think that needs to stop. So I think at the, I don't know, I used to work in, not work, but I did some screenwriting. And to get a movie made, it's really, really hard. Like if you want to get financing, you have to jump like through a lot of hoops, win contests, but to, it seems like it's so easy to publish a study. Like yeah. I know it's hard, but it should be harder. Yeah. Like It's not like we're like, hey, we need more terrible little studies. Like, we have way too many. Yeah, I So agree. it should be, there should be a higher threshold. There should be more hoops you need to jump through to get a study approved. 100%, yeah. And uh, just to give an example, like, because it, it also, the problem with small studies is that they're easy to throw in the trash. So like, if you did invest much in a study, it's rare that you have a small negative study. It's usually like a big, like the big study that everybody's been waiting for that's pre-trial reg uh, registered everyone's waiting for they're going to publish that one because it took a lot of resources so they need to you know show something for it but the small study is like eh, it doesn't work they're not going to publish it and i think that's problematic because like i think they did an umbrella review it was in 2019 i think i saved that uh oh yeah the marco zanis 2017 umbrella review uh they basically you can do like a they compared their meta-analysis to the other ones. And what you can do is you can take the biggest RCT in uh, for each uh, outcome that you're measuring and compare that to the average. And what they saw is that like when, when you compare the average to the average using the biggest RCT, like the highest quality study, the average was, was much higher. So they, they showed way better results. And it was only... Um, it was only statistically significant in 29% of cases, uh, whereas usually it was way higher. So basically I did a little like tablecloth mat and it was like, basically there's probably at least 31% of negative studies that are not published if we were based on that. Cause like, again, these meta analysis and that's one of the problems with small, terrible studies being like overcrowding the research is that we do meta analysis mm -hmm. on that. And we were basically analyzing bullshit yeah. And then like one or two odd good studies. And it's really just polluting the research. And I don't know. I just think that needs to stop. So in terms of the research out there right now, if you're going to give a really I don't know, blunt estimate of what's good and what's bad, what would you say? What percentage of the research do you think is decent research in the physio world? In the physio world? Uh really good question that, that you would approve of if you if you went through the methodology everything and you finished yeah. reading that paper you would give a tick to some and across to others and you would uh, say that's that's relevant it's i can use that and if you were doing a meta analysis yeah. you could definitely use it you know depends on what like i think it's more political if we're looking at effects if we're looking at like 
uh, validating if something is is like works or is like a good outcome measure. Like, you know, those boring studies that have no impact and there's no like money yeah. behind it, yeah. but they're really useful. Um, uh, I'd say it's probably high, like probably pretty good. But if we look at studies that look at a specific intervention, where there's a lot of money at stake, like the K-tape studies, for instance, <laughs> I'd say it's probably really high. The number of studies that is terrible. I'd say, honestly, and that's based on like purely my biased opinion, I'd say probably like 50% of studies could be thrown out. Yeah. But, or and, you should pull the studies together and just make one good study. And, and if a study is pretty conclusive and it's well done, say, for instance, let's use the K-tape as an example. If it yeah. said... If it was well done, the methods were great. The results were, you know, they weren't biased at all. There was a good study. And it said K-tape is a load of shit. Yeah. Do we then need another 10 studies to reinforce that? Yeah, because it wasn't the right color. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good point. These are logic for the ultrasound and all that, that stuff, yeah. That's one of the frustrations on my end is the fact that I feel like there's a replication of studies that don't need to be done. 100%, yeah. So I, I feel like there's, you know, there's a certain amount of topics that we need to research, but there's yeah. so many studies that are done that just don't need to be done because we already know that or yeah. the study you're about to do is a load of shit, you know? Yeah. I wouldn't say like replication studies are, there's not enough. There's like very, there's kind of little, like where they're actually like specifically redoing replication studies. But we, mm. we, I think what you mean is like studies that have like a similar design. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, those are yeah. terrible. But replication, yeah. I think we actually need more. And I think- Yeah, Eric replicating, was, it would probably yeah. use the wrong word, as yeah. trying, to, trying to figure out or answer a question that's already yeah. been answered, you know? I agree, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing, and I, honestly, most of the things I'm citing is stuff that Eric Mayer has already mentioned because he's kind of yep. the king of calling out stupid studies. Um, one of the ways we can work around that is by forcing pre-registration uh, trials. Like, uh, sorry, just forcing pre-registration. So basically, yeah. when you do a study, you submit the protocol, and the advantage for the researcher is that, if I recall, they're, they're pre-approved. So basically they're like, yeah, you're, you basically put it up to be challenged and everyone can like <laughs> criticize it or whatever. It's like open. And then if it passes, you're basically pre-approved. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, that saves you a lot of hoops to jump through by doing it in advance. But then after that, people can see if you do postdoc changes in your protocol. So a good example would be people who like look at like, they cast a wide net, they look at like 90 uh, variables and then they find one that's positive and it's probably statistical noise, but they'll say, Hey, you know what? They changed their protocol and they're like, yeah, we were looking at that from the start and it works. So it's crazy. This treatment really works. Whereas it's probably just like a uh, random noise. So if you do a pre-trial registration, you're going to be able to compare the protocol and be like, yeah, you guys just like you, you lied basically. So you prevent that kind of stuff. So it makes the studies a bit better, but also just from the fact that you're putting it for registration, people are going to be able to, and, I think journals should invest in people to do that. It's just not going to pass. It's not going to get approved because it's a bad study. Um, and yeah, I, there's another idea I had would be, <laughs> do you know what sycophants are? No? Okay. So, well, it's like it, they changed the word in recent years, but uh, a sycophant in ancient Greece uh, it's basically, they were kind of like uh, an in-between for the police. The, they were basically hired snitched. Right. So basically they would report crimes to the military because there was no, I don't think there was like police in Greece. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but basically the same thing with for journals. So basically you give a prize money to detect a bad study. Archie comics actually had that. They had, they wanted to teach kids grammar or, and I think also they just, they, they were publishing too fast to correct correctly. So basically if you find a mistake, you get your name in the paper and you get some money. They could that do that anonymously, but basically it would, keep scientists on their toes to not do some random bullshit and uh, yeah it would make engage the readership so people would want to read because they could get money out of it and they would read more attentively right it's like if you're watching a movie that's really engaging in terms of like a mystery story you're gonna listen you're gonna want to you know know what it is so it can make science more interesting and more uh drive the engagement which you know is kind of the magic word in the social media age we live in yeah so that's another another idea I think would kind of solve some problems. It could it would mm. honestly it would probably create more because people would 
feel maybe afraid of publishing, but I think it's better than what we have now. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's too long, but probably maybe just touch on the fact that, uh, you know, the peer review process is not paid for. Yeah. It's basically volunteer work and it might be why it's not producing stellar results. Mm. Like there's a lot of bad papers published because um, it's, yeah, I don't know, it just doesn't work. There was a systematic review that was done um, uh, in the last couple of years and they looked at strategies to improve basically the peer review process, make it more efficient. The only thing that they found that worked, uh, if I recall, was a blinding the reviewers. So basically you don't know who's reviewing you, which is kind of rare. They don't usually do that. Um, that's better and it didn't cost any resources. So there are other solutions that had a marginal effect, but the problem is that they increase cost and time to review. So that's not good for journals, but this one is literally one they can do tomorrow. Mm. Like, okay, we don't know who's reviewing you anymore. And I think if, it was like, I think it was like a big effect. I think it was like 29% improvement in, in the, like the quality of the papers. I mean, that's an arbitrary number, but whatever. Yeah, I think that's it. What's your gripe with the, the literature? What do you hate about the literature? I was going to ask you this question. What question would you like answered right now if you were going to do a study? I mean, I don't want to get... But that's I'm working on my application for the PhD, so I don't want right, someone to steal it. <laughs> do you, do you have I can find one? another one. Do you uh, have another question? One? Yeah. Like, um, is, there, is there something in practice where you think, I'd love to do a study on this to figure out this? Um, or if there's wait, a hole, it, or if there's a hole in the research somewhere, that you, where you think I could fill it and do a good study, and it not be a shit one. Um, okay, I'll just fuck it. I'll say it. So the the goal of my PhD thesis would be, um, it's one of the areas. The one avenue would be misinformation, but the other would be, uh, if you look at the flexion debate, there's like a big. The base always like a selection good, a selection bad. If you look at the research, in my opinion, it's pretty clear that flexion is fine, except loaded flexion at the extreme. So like basically a very heavy Jefferson curl, or a, I guess you could call it Jefferson deadlift, where you're like really in a lot of flexion and trying to lift the weight. That hasn't been tested because all the animal studies, it's between like zero to 30 degrees. It's a very small amount of flexion that is basically unavoidable. So the argument for against flexion is basically saying you should work out at all because flesh is bad <laughs> it's not like you shouldn't squat or you shouldn't deadlift because yeah, yeah it just doesn't make sense like the conclusion don't make sense whatever and it's even worse than that if we look at the details but my point is the only thing that we can't say conclusively hey this is safe is again loaded flexion near maximal loads in complete flexion so basically just bending down completely and doing a jefferson curl so what i'd like to do is an rct where i get people to do uh jefferson curls for six months and then compare it to people who were coached to keep like a very neutral spine during a deadlift, maybe use like a contraption that forces them to stay there. I don't know. And then you take MRIs uh, after six months and you check if there's disc damage. It's very straightforward. And then you obviously monitor for pain and changes in outcome and strength. So like you got four outcomes and it's just, I got to find people who are crazy enough to do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, Loaded that's the, near uh, maximum and you effort match, obviously like you don't make them like very, very light Jefferson curls compared to maximal deadlifts. I'd go like all out and you maybe do two times a week. That's probably the biggest hurdle you've got is finding people to do that. Yeah. Who uh, squat you as a nocebo to death. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Gotta find someone with no social media, naive, like a farmer. I don't know. Yeah, well, maybe they're the people that you need to target. You need to go out to the woods, go into Montana or somewhere like that. Bring an MRI machine to the woods. <laughs> yeah. Find some uh, some indigenous populations that have never seen any of the social media stuff in the Amazon somewhere. You know that tribe that like shoots people with arrows as soon as they come? <laughs> I want to man. talk to you about the message of Jefferson Curls, guys. Get a uh, Get an MRI machine helicoptered into the amazon tribe and then do your study out there yeah i could also take videos of them like slow-mo video footage of them and send them to goda for uh for research <laughs> you love that guy you love ripping indian uh, i mean it's not one guy it's a group of guys a group of guys yeah they were asking me on social media sometimes so they're pretty funny to be honest how many this is a great question to finish up how many instagram accounts have blocked you uh Probably some I don't know. Big ones, probably like 
10 to 12 since I started. I have way more on my personal. I used to get blocked all the time on my personal because I would waste my time in their comments. Now I just need them on my page. And I think they mostly leave me alone. But yeah, my favorite, the most, the worst one was Kelly Starrett. Uh, or no, oh, really? actually, what's his name? Kelly Starr and then Ben, whatever his name is, Ben, uh, the guy, the Pat Davidson uh, assistant. Because I got blocked the day after they posted something about uh, guys being intellectually honest is, you know, is to have debate and be open to other ideas. And I disagree with him and he blocked me. <laughs> and it was all respectful. I was like, yeah, like, look at this study. Like, I completely disagree. I yeah, think he yeah. said, like, if you're against foam rolling, you're against like every massage and everything. I was like, that's a straw man. You know, that's like saying, you know, like Vietnam wasn't good guys. So like, you know, World War II, the US shouldn't have intervened. Like it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a false dichotomy. Like you can be for against form rolling and be for massage. It's not the same thing. And I don't know, you just block me automatically. I love when people do that. They want, they, they like, they act like all pompous, like they love science. And then as soon as you present it to them, they block you. It's very cool and scientific. And good clinicians are open to changing their mind. Yeah. And if science comes along that debunks what something that they thought they knew, well, they need to be man enough or open enough to uh, to take it on board. 100%, yeah. Like I've it's changed, unpleasant, though. I've, changing I've, changed, I've, changed, I've changed my mind so many times over the years. Yeah. And some of the shit that we learned in uni was so far off the mark, it's just absurd. Yeah. So, no, I, I like that idea in terms of a study. Good luck finding the participants, but yeah, no, that sounds great. <laughs> you want to be one? <laughs> um, look, I have my fair share of a little few you know, back niggles here and there. So, oh, yeah, yeah maybe not maybe. the best idea. Maybe. Okay. We'll see if I can uh, get distance patients. You can, yeah. fly, you can fly me to the Amazon. Um, okay. Any, any last words before we finish up? I think that's been about, I don't know, 45, 50 minutes, something like that. Uh, check my YouTube page. I did the... Uh, yeah, I, go I checked it out move, last night. Yeah, go to move you and functional patterns. Because it's all, it's all the same debate. They're all like movement and posture will kill you. And I'm like, well, what does the sign say? So I answer them all together. So everyone, someone asked me, hey, what do you think of Naudi? I'm like, look at my video. Hey, what do you think of Goda? Look at my video. I'm probably going to do a PRI one soon. Well, eventually yes. because people keep asking me. Yes. Do a it's PRI. just they're really hard to review. Yeah. Because like they I, do cite a study, but it's I, like, what is, sorry. I got exposed Go to PRI back 2015. I worked at a clinic where he was right into it and blowing up balloons and stuff would help back pain. Um, and look, I, at the time I was like, oh yeah, I'll look into this. And I looked into it and, you know, it just didn't make any sense to me. You know, your foot, yeah. hurt, your foot hurts because you don't breathe properly. Um, but yes, you should do that. PRI, that's a good one. I will. Uh, just trying to think of someone else you could. But it's one have of the done, approaches. Have you done Seedman? Oh, yeah, so many times. Yeah. Uh, I haven't attacked him. Like... On YouTube though? Not on YouTube, no. Yeah. No, I Please. usually send people to the Sam Spinelli video, but I should do one on Seedman and like look at it uh, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I got tagged. Or got sent that dip. Did you see the dip yesterday? The um, he had like, um, it was the world's greatest dip. That was the tagline, and he was doing a dip on power bands, like really thick power bands. Yeah. And he's had his hand on the power bands in between two, um, like a rack, and he was yeah. doing dips on the power band, um, with a chain around his neck. <laughs> yeah, that guy's so goofy. Oh my god. But yeah. it gets likes and it gets, mate, like so many people commenting on it. Like, this is cool. Like, how strong are you? And I'm going to try this. I'm just like, oh, my God. People will believe I'm, anything. Yeah, people don't know better. Like, yeah. If you showed me a video of someone doing heart surgery, I would have no idea if, it, if he's doing it right, right? Yeah, it's a good point. It's just everyone eats, everyone works out. So they think that they're experts. Yeah. Like, I don't know, even me, like a couple of years ago, I'm not like a genius, but like a couple of years ago, I'd be like, yeah, that guy's an idiot, probably. And just because I'm learning and probably in five years, I'm going to think I'm a, I'm a dumbass, but that's, that's just called learning, you know? Yeah. You got to be willing to change your mind for sure. Yeah. All right. So where can all the listeners find you? I assume it's just no bullshit physio on YouTube and Instagram. 
Yeah, and Twitter if you want to see me argue with smarter people. Yep. And I don't mean I don't mean you. You're smart. I just mean like smarter <laughs> people than me. I know, no, no. I'm... And we're not arguing. Yeah, we're not arguing. We're agreeing. Yeah. Um, you couldn't offend me. Good luck. Um <laughs> and in regards to the pragmatic principle stuff. Yeah, what, uh, what... we're gonna start to launch uh more regularly. And again, we're working on the course. I'm about halfway in mine. I think Jacob's almost done with it because he's been working on it for a couple of years. He's got like, that guy's a nerd. He's got like files of it saved. Uh, so he just pulls that out. And then Iliad's probably almost done with this. So yep. I guess I'm just the one that needs to kick my butt and finish. But yeah, it's going to be good. My lectures on barriers to exercise and yep. the mechanisms of exercise. Are you getting Mike Boyle uh, to be a guest? Huh? Are you getting Mike Boyle to be a guest? Oh yeah, I should. Yeah. You should. Uh, like expert lecture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I think the others are like on principles of um, treatment of low back pain by Jacob, I'm pretty sure. And then Elliot is uh, principles of like resistance training for uh, clinicians. So basically yeah. just the basics on like how to prescribe exercise. If you haven't been taught it pretty yeah. well, which I mean, if you're like me and you and he didn't learn much. Uh, yeah. Sounds great. Well, thanks. For the listeners out there, jump onto that. It sounds like a really good option if you are a new grad or you're a student and you're wanting to learn more or you're frustrated the fact that you haven't learned enough about that stuff um, through your uni career. I've lost you. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I'm there, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks again. Um, for the listeners, we're doing a roundtable podcast in a couple of months. Uh, so it'll be Alexis Jacob Templar, who's been on the podcast before and he's also doing the pragmatic principles with Alexis and uh, Jeff, our buddy from um, Sunshine Coast, who is doing some great things on Instagram. He's Be Strong Physio, is that? Be the... Strong Physio, yeah, love yeah. that guy. Yeah, he's doing he's doing great stuff. He's very amusing. Um, so yeah, looking forward to that. This podcast is live on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, and Spotify. And there's probably, it's probably on other channels. I don't know. I just upload it. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> any final thoughts, Alexis? No, just thanks for having me again. My pleasure. We'll chat again soon. And as usual, stay strong.